Hi, and welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, today, my guest is Ed Calderon. Ed worked in law enforcement on the northern Mexico border, and uh, he also has the blog Ed's Manifesto. And of course, he's very well known for his uh, various Elvia knives, uh, knives of his own design that have been made by uh, Rick Lala, Copus Designs, Emerson Knives, uh, that's the latest incarnation of it, uh, and others. Ed, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for having me on. It is, it is my pleasure. So, so just to give everyone some context, uh, tell me a little bit about your background uh, in law enforcement. Uh, I spent about uh, 12 years working uh, in law enforcement in Mexico. Um, I did a lot of uh, counter-narcotic specific uh, work down there uh, from, uh, from field eradications to the people trafficking to organized crime to uh, a lot of these a lot of these types of uh, things down there um, also did a lot of uh, work as a as an executive protection agent uh, for a few uh, high-level clients down there including a governor and a head of a, and a head of state security um, and uh, I grew up down there I was like uh, that's a that's that that's my hometown uh that all all of, uh, all of uh, northern mexico is basically my hometown um after after things went uh, pretty bad po politically and internally in that office i used to work with i uh decided to um call it quits and um and look uh look for the american dream so uh, i've been up here in the us for about three years now almost three years um doing classes uh putting uh, putting some of the uh, skills and the experiences that I had down there to to, to use and sharing it with the uh, law enforcement, military, if I could do classes for Homeland um, and civilians across the country. So what was it that kind of made you leave? What was the last straw? <laughs> uh, a, a very, very direct and open corruption uh, situation down there. I mean, corruption has uh, corruption has always been a part of being in law enforcement in, in Mexico. Uh, bribes, pay, being paid uh, to work for a specific side of a cartel, or things like that. Uh, we were relatively sheltered from a lot of that. Um, actually, the unit that I used to be in had a U.S. Uh, police certification through a, through an organization called Calia. So it was it was it was as clean as it could get in Mexico. Um, all of us got uh, FBI background checks. All of us would get um, polygraph exams and stuff like that. Um, and uh, at some point during the last presidency, all of that ended. Um, it was declared uh, unconstitutional to put to fire people over their uh, polygraph exams and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So things kind of reverted back to a pretty uh, bad and corrupt nature um, I was uh, I was offered to play for a team uh, and when I say and when I say that I mean the offer was plata o plomo uh, lead or silver um, so I decided to resign right there and then and, and left to the US Wait, explain that last part the plato uh, plata o plomo basically they said letter lead, lead or silver if you want to work for us so we can pay you in silver, or pay you in lead if you refuse that type of thing. Lead or silver? Wow. Yeah, um, that was a weird. Uh, every now and then, <laughs> people look at some of the hand gestures that I that I do in some of the on some of my pictures, and, uh, and uh, a way that they would communicate that would be they put, would point up and then it would point down, right? Like, what do you want? You wanna you wanna stay alive or you wanna uh, keep working? Type thing. So I had to. I had to make a quick decision gladly and and uh thank god i had a lot of uh, a big support network on the u.s side uh that kind of helped me transition from that old job to to what i'm doing now so i uh you know uh, did look back so during those 12 years of working law enforcement on the northern mexico border um, what kind of Describe the kind of things that you see uh, working against the cartels. Uh, uh, just for context, uh, I live in suburbia, and any menace here is under the surface. It can't be seen. What was it like there? I mean, uh, uh, when I first started, it was pretty lawless. I mean, it is still pretty lawless, but uh, 
very overtly lawless. I mean, uh, middle of the day, uh, the eight-car convoy of people with AK-47s rolling down uh, the downtown Tijuana and abducting, you know, businessmen um, in broad daylight or getting to shootouts uh, in broad daylight uh, with the military. And then um, and I quickly realized it wasn't a, a policing type problem. It was more of a urban guerrilla warfare type situation. It was a, it was a, it was, I mean, what's happening down there is, is, uh, is a narco insurgency is it isn't a, uh, it isn't a problem with crime or, or uh, it isn't a policing problem as, as, uh, as, as some of the people in the U S kind of want to think, kind of want to make it seem like it's a failed state in a lot of ways. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I saw down there was, you know, t um, yeah, I think uh, when, when I used to go to the U S and train with um, the military and the police, um, I think I, I would find more common ground with the experiences that we were getting down in Mexico with people coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq than what I would mm. people that would work for the LAPD or, or some of these other agencies uh, stateside. So closer to a war zone than something that was happening or, or than a lifestyle just right across the border. Yeah, I mean, people, people in Mexico live in denial and people in the U.S. live in denial and they don't think it's a war zone. I mean, it's not a traditional Syrian uh, type uh, war zone, but it, uh, when it comes to bodies and firearms and convoys and whole slots of the country being controlled by cartels, it's very much a narco insurgency war going on down in Mexico. So definitely a, a war zone. Well, I, I hope that is uh, I hope that ship is righted because it's a beautiful culture and it's such a beautiful place to visit. I haven't been there in a long time, but um, you know, I hope I hope that all turns around. You, you're on the Knife Junkie podcast. We are going to talk about the Elvia and, and other knives. Um, but uh, tell us the story behind uh, the fruit knife, uh, the origin of the Elvia. Uh, so uh, knives, in, in Mexico, knives are a part of, that, that they're, they're cultural uh, things. Um, uh, contrary to, to a lot of uh, beliefs out there, uh, Mexico has a, a very deep knife culture that goes back to its uh, you know, pre pre Hispanic uh, days. Having a means to cut or having a means to process is a thing that you know it's very prevalent down there still to this day. Uh, you go to any uh, taco spot in the corner and you'll see a man sharpening sharpening one of these big scimitar looking uh, knives out there. And it wasn't uncommon for most of uh, for most of my childhood that I would carry a Okay, I would carry a pocket knife. Um, my mom was very influential in that she would um, she would uh, uh, make food from scratch uh, per se. So uh, pr uh, being able to process a chicken, being able to process a goat, being able to process uh, animal, um, uh, I experienced that from a young age. And I saw my mom would always carry uh, a, a German folding knife, which I may have somewhere around here. Um, she would carry this, uh, this is exactly the knife she would carry. So, oh, cool. Uh, let's see it. Wow. That looks uh, beautiful and well used. That's, um, as far as I can tell, it's German. So that classic divot that I put on all my knife designs, mm -hmm. that's right there. Um, no lock on it, so she would always work against the lock with the blade facing uh, forward or with the, if she was retracting or drawing her cuts for processing, she would always you know, go against the uh, the lock on the the the, the, uh, the folding mechanism on the blade, right? Um, this little guy is what got my hamster wheels turning when I was a kid. Um, she would always carry it uh, folded in her um like a sh uh, on her shirt she would just uh, press it on her shirt fold it two times and kind of tuck it into her pants mm -hmm. and when she needed it she would grab her t-shirt or her shirt lift it and have the knife in her hand right um it, it's but it's uh, that's that's like traditional stuff in mexico um she, uh, from an early age she would say uh, if you kill it you're gonna eat it right so 
every now and then we would find rattlesnakes around the house, uh, ranch house, and we would have to not only process a rattlesnake but uh, eat it. You know, we would salt the meat and dry it out and then have like uh, some pretty good rattlesnake ceviche. Oh, you know, that's so good. <laughs> oh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, you have to dry out the meat. And then uh, after 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 a few weeks, you grind, you put it in a blender, you store it in a little bag, and when you want to eat it, you just put some lemon in there to to kind of moisturize the meat again, and it's good to go. Uh, to this day, I still uh, you know I still eat a few of these. Still keep the rattles. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we would uh, we would sell them to uh, musicians. Uh, they would put them inside of their guitars. That's like a traditional Mexican thing. Oh, cool. Uh, so, so my mom, uh, my mom would carry that knife, and later on in life, I'd have to uh, had to go out there and work <laughs> for a living. Um, I, I, we, I think we all go through these processes where we grow up with things that work, forget about what works for some reason, and buy ridiculous things that don't work <laughs> because because they're they look cool or tactical or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I kind of went through something like that, and. Um, bought a, a bunch of useless knives uh, during my early the, early, the early part of my career. Um, and then eventually, after losing a few expensive knives and after kind of realizing that if you carry something expensive, something tactical looking, um, something with a lot of uh, connotations of, of, its, of its actual application or the reasoning beyond of its design, um, if you carry it in the open in a place where you're supposed to be blending in, it's going to draw the wrong amount of attention to you. Uh, so eventually, I, I uh, we, we used to fly back and forth between Tijuana and Mexico City. And uh, interestingly enough, our, per, our our firearms permits would allow us to fly with uh, a rifle, a pistol, magazines, and plate armor for it but they wouldn't allow us to fly with knives, <laughs> right? So we would have to buy knives uh, uh, and actually keep them in Mexico City uh, or b vice versa. We would leave them somewhere just to have on hand in case, you know, whatever. Uh, there was a commissary, uh, there was a little uh, store, like a gift store in Mexico City, and they had uh, Victory Knox uh, fruit knives, whereas uh, one of the... Uh, the bird speak knives was one of the things they sold there. So the first time I the first time I saw them, I bought one. You know, looked at the shape, made sense. You know, in my and for, for my background and and learning from my mom, uh, picked that knife up, uh, ground a uh, little finger divot on it so I can orientate the handle and the the edge on it. Uh, with a plastic bottle bottle, I melted a sheet for it and just tucked it in my pants. <laughs> that and. Uh, and that's kind of turned into a whole thing right now. Everybody's uh, making them. Yeah. So you talk about the finger groove and, and the orientating the blade. This is uh, edge in. Uh, you, are, you are making it so that the blade is specifically edge in, uh, and you grip it point down in an ice pick grip. What, what's the um, – uh, that is something you don't see often, uh, but you see a dedicated kind of uh, following to that kind of deployment. Yeah, I mean, as as a as a as a, I'll speak completely about it as a tool first. Mm -hmm. um, you do see that uh, grip, and it, uh, a lot of people think it's like a fighting grip, or they call it pical, or they or they think it's something that uh, was it was uh, developed for fighting by somebody out there. Um, you could actually see it with some when somebody's processing a deer on a on a, on a hanging uh, a hanging deer, or when somebody's uh, processing uh, some beef, you can actually see this uh, knife grip being utilized where people uh, flip the knife with the edge pointed uh, towards their elbow or flip the knife with the edge pointed towards their shoulder if they're going in, into a hammer grip. Um, it's basically utilizing leverage, the leverage that your body produces on the blade by um, using the edge as a pickup point. So imagine I'm going to cut the leg off a uh, hanging beer I pull the, le the deer leg down as I go into a reverse grip, uh, holding the knife in such a way where I can use my body weight t to mm -hmm. leverage that knife through ligaments and, 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 uh, and flesh. Um, 
it's 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 actually a very natural knife grip for for most things. Um, and now speaking of it, and completely in the context of a weapon, um, most knife fighting uh, expressions out there are based on a dueling uh, based culture or methodology. So you so let's say you have a knife and I have a knife. It wouldn't make sense for me to go into reverse pickle grip against you because I have to fend fend off your knife as it's coming to attack me. So I need to go into a, a saber grip with the edge outwards. So it's a so range can, issue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, oddly enough, uh, our day and age, you're focusing on ambushing and counter ambushing. So being able to conceal, palm the knife and use it as a bludgeoning, almost stabbing bludgeoning point when you're using it is more akin to what you're actually going to utilize instead of going into a forward grip uh, with a with a fighting stance. That's not really what you see. Um, so uh, I've gotten to speak and talk to and see a lot of violence related with knives that in, during my time. And I always took the time to kind of sit down with some of these people and learn from them specifically, you know, how they modified knives, what knives they used, what geometri geomet ge geometrical preferences they had and why they would use a knife as they used it, right? So a, a lot of that stuff I just basically wrote down. That's, uh, that, that was what originally the manifesto was, was uh, a few moleskins with a bunch of weird criminal notes as far as, uh, you know, <laughs> hood rat field craft uh, type uh, things in there. Um, so the the um, method that you use uh, in this sort of uh, tip down edge in uh, is it libre fighting libre fighting is that uh, it, it? It was it was a it was a it, that was a system that I that I trained in for for a while actually became an instructor under libre for for uh, for a bit um, that was like my that was a start in, in me trying to. You know, figure out how to not only collect it, but also teach it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I learned it, but uh, when I do classes, I don't, uh, I don't teach a style. Uh, I really, when I do, I do all these uh, classes that that uh, I call weaponology classes, mm -hmm. um, where I take uh, students in through a process of uh, uh, an experience-based learning um, two-day thing. Where I not only show them what uh, what possibilities exist around them as far as fabricating, uh, making, uh, carrying components of uh, certain things that you that could build you a weapon, not just pointed weapons, but also uh, improvised chemical, uh, improvised uh, impact, improvised a lot of weird things that I show people. Um, but uh, I take them through the process of not only selecting objects, but also figuring out how you can use these objects in a place where you're not allowed to have anything. And at the end, I, uh, we have a pig there, a pig carcass that we use to simulate a torso. And I actually go through some of the criminal methods that I show them. And I show them uh, how, what they would act like and how they would feel like. So people come out of there with not only a the modern historical knife context of that as far as why people choose what they choose and what works, but also an experience of them actually having uh, used some of it in, on a simulator that's about as close as you can get. Uh, you call it your um, organic medium entry class, I believe. Uh, yeah. That's how I've that's how I've seen it written down, and that makes you know it says everything right there. But it also makes per perfect sense. Um, you know, you say you've been training in Kali for years and you're used to training with a with a partner who's a willing partner and you're used to doing Carenza and kind of f flipping stuff around and, you know, doing doing your your work. But then you don't have the experience unless you seek it out with impact and what it actually feels like to hold on to it as it's as it's reaching resistance and all this kind of thing. Uh, there, There's a few elements that uh, that uh, become apparent when you go and actually do an organic medium uh, testing the segment. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the pig itself hanging uh, has a little bit of motion to it and has a little bit of gib. It's not the most, uh, the most uh, direct, uh, clear uh, example of a human because it doesn't have uh, a lot of liquid in it. It doesn't actually defend itself. 
Mm-hmm. And some of the motion is that, that uh, we can replicate on it is just relegated to it trying to move out of the way. So uh, people come in with a traditional martial arts background into the class. They've trained with wooden knife trainers. They've trained with uh, aluminum trainers their whole life. Uh, and they might not train resistance, right? So one thing I change is uh, I have these uh, stubby knives made, which are basically made out of uh, hot water pipe insulation. Uh, one thing that these thing, one thing that they offer is that they collapse in on themselves every time you stab them into the chest uh, on somebody for, uh, in training in a training scenario. They don't hurt. You, you'll usually feel a fist just pumping into your chest, which is exactly what a stab will actually feel like. So, when you get people without that experience uh, coming towards the animal and getting into a position where they could stab it, usually people only half. Uh, the half of the point will go in. They will hold themselves back. They will kind of, mm-hmm. the, they'll kind of curl the elbow and the shoulder back, uh, retaining the, the the stabbing point into not being able to stab all the way through. Um, now that's not what you would actually experience. So um, one thing I we get Wait. students uh, to kind of replicate is that pumping mechanism of stabbing into the chest and actually creating a, a, a chest compression every time you do, because that's what criminals do. That's what they train themselves to do. Um, knife uh, knife fighting has no place in actual modern day asymmetric edge weapons warfare. It's more about uh, accelerating the effect. If you talk to anybody that actually kills people for a living using bladed, bladed objects, uh, other than uh, other than uh, targeting uh, anatomical targeting, they, they they will talk about accelerations. Accelerations. Uh, what, yeah, it's and it's something you know. I, people people will start probably start using that, and I, I, as far as I know, because I trained with everybody, <laughs> I've trained with everyone and and, and anything on the, under the sun. I've only heard a few of my of my instructors talk about it, and it's something I talk about openly in the classes. Uh, and acceleration is basically anything you any any sort of stimulus uh, applied by the attacker after the stab to make things have to make to make the effects of uh, of the wound, uh, or basically the bleed times uh, act faster. Mm-hmm. So you'll get a guy that knows what he's doing, uh, giving you a nice thick uh, stab to the chest. And after stabbing you twice, he'll go into a fury of punches onto your chest, or, oh, or geez. elbow, or, or, or elbow raking your chest, or smothering you with their hands to make uh, bleeding times, you know, um, go a little bit faster. So we talk about some of these things, uh, accelerations, and and also an acceleration could be you on your, on the ground with your back on the ground, or against a wall. And so each of the stabs and hits basically compresses your chest, mm-hmm. right? And it's, it's something that, there. yeah, I mean, it's something that a lot of people don't know about because a lot of people never sat down and talked to some of these people. Maybe a lot of people never experienced them, these things firsthand. And, and a lot of people out there, especially in the martial arts side of the uh, side of the community, um, uh, usually uh, usually learn to swim in a pool with other fish that swim exactly like they do. <laughs> um, I, I went out there. I, I, I will tell people I'm a cautionary tale. I had no experience. I went out there and seeked it out. And after I gained the experience, I was like, I should have, I should have trained first, <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, but I didn't. So I, I kind of went out uh, ba- in a backwards manner. Um, another thing we simulate on the animal is, is our extractions. Uh, another thing that is not commonly taught in most, if not any uh, martial expression that I've seen when it comes to blades um, knives have a tendency to get stuck into bony areas, specifically around the larger joints of the human body. And also when people are wearing clothing, uh, people, uh, knives get stuck, uh, it may be uh, caused because of the geometry of the blade. It may be because it has serrations. It may be because a lot of things. Um, so the thing I also replicate on the animal are extractions, which are basically ways of extracting the blade when it gets snagged. Uh, this includes uh, bumping your own arm out, uh, using your hip to bump the blade out, or doing the sign of the cross on the animal to extract the blade, and actually include that into the way people can practice or, ex- or uh, train some of this type of stuff. 
and it's uh, it's all it all becomes pretty uh, pretty clear and apparent why I show that when we have students step up step up to the animal mm -hmm. and start testing uh, testing what they carry. Usually, I always tell them to bring three things in: uh, what they carry every day, uh, as far as a knife, um, what they have any sort of uh, curiosity about, you know, so we get some pretty interesting things in. And uh, an improvised weapon that that can't cost them anything, and they, that they can that they made in less than five minutes. And I go through how how that can how that can uh, happen and how you can do it. Um, so I, students come in with those three things, and that, I just create an experience for them. So what do you find with um, you know you were talking about big uh, uh, collections of crazy expensive knives? I have one of those, uh, and. Uh, I carry them because I love them, but I also think of them as a weapon in my pocket, you know, uh, uh, just in case. But that's all very um, theoretical until it's not. So what have you found with what people carry every day in terms of its weapon ability? Uh, you know, uh, there's there's certain things out there that I that I will tell you, a personal experience that I that I see are wrong or that don't, they don't work how you would think under duress. Uh, that a lot of people carry are rings on blades, or karambits. Uh, like... Yeah, the, so the karambit is one. Uh, the sock pea is another. Uh, the kernel blade is another. Uh, blades or knives that have rings on them, mm -hmm. uh, carried by people that are also shooters or 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 work some sort of military law enforcement type. Uh, work in a military law enforcement type setting. Uh, I've had many groups come through the class, and I take them through a uh, weaponology and uh, organic medium entry uh, testing uh, setting. Um, and uh, putting your 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 shooting finger through a metal ring that you can peel a carrot with mm. isn't the best option uh, out there that I that, that I've seen. And I and I'm aware that a lot of people will prescribe to its ability for retention. Uh, when you get into a grappling situation with somebody and firearms are involved and knives are involved, the ability for you to grab your knife and switch it from one hand to the other is something that you will see expressed time and time again in live leaks videos of stabbings, in actual real life encounters. People will switch the, 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 the knife from one hand to the other because, uh, as a defensive mechanism, most people will try and grab on or grapple the armed hand. So that's what you need. And when you put a ring on your blade, it negates that. So it basically, it's that's another bad thing <laughs> when you talk about uh, uh, knives meant for fighting. Basically, it's like it's like retention to a fault in that case. Yeah, I mean, it it, it makes it might make sense one on one with somebody that doesn't want to run away. Uh, but it doesn't. Once you put two on one, once you make it a grappling situation, uh, rings on knives really start to show their failings. Um, also, a lot of people assume that, like Ed, karambits are that they, they're in nature. Well, not really. Karambits are not in nature. Um, you would have to reverse the karambit edge so the edge is pointed downwards. So it does look like a tiger claw. Because to this day, I've never seen a, a lion or a tiger kind of scooping up uh, its prey into its mouth. That's not how it works, and that's how a karambit is shaped. Uh, and um, there's only two instances of ring knives in, in, in historical weaponry that I've been able to see. And there's a few weird ones from India that have rings, but uh, and India's weird all around. Uh, but uh, there's only two historical uh, situations where I've seen rings on knives that can have some sort of uh, relationship to how we use blades now, and that is the gypsy uh, shears that would get uh, split in half to fight with with a ring on them, and the karambit. And both of these were basically tools first that could be improvised as weapons later. So um, not the best options out there that I've seen. Not the best ones. Uh, not real. Not realistically. So it's one. Of the, there, there are some of them. The the knives that are more prone to failure out there. Um, um, there's some out there that you know that might that that do work. You know for what they are. Uh, but uh, I remember 
talking to Emerson once at a uh, at a one of one of the uh, USN gathering shows, and I showed him something with a ring on it that somebody at the show uh, uh, let me borrow, um, and it was pretty ridiculous. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Emerson looked at me and said, "Whoever made that's a martial artist, right?" I was like, "Yeah, how did you know?" He just, uh, <laughs> he just laughed at that. Those. Were, the, the worst ideas usually come from some some of these people that make some of these uh, things, right? Um, uh, we want to reinvent the wheel at times, and uh, most of the things uh, that knife design related uh, specifically for fighting have already been done. Uh, yeah. There was a time and place where we depended on these blades, and a lot of these expressions are already out there if you kind of look for them. So what do you find from uh, people carrying nice folders? And they, they carry them in their pockets, and they're going to use them as their self defense thing. What what do you what do you find? Well, you know, you, you tell them like uh, if it doesn't make sense in a gun range, it shouldn't make sense in a knife range. Uh, is 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 something that I compl- I, I consistently repeat uh, over and over again in the class. Um, it doesn't make sense for me to buy a gun, never test it out, and just carry it. That doesn't make sense, mm-hmm. right? And if I'm carrying around a knife that has some sort of indication or intention behind it as far as it being utilized as a weapon. And I never test it out. It's the same thing. You know, that's one thing I kind of talk to uh, talk about it with people is that um, I personally like carrying around knives that are great tools. And if uh, something bad happens, I could feasibly use them as a weapon. Right. That's kind of my mindset when I, when I, when I carry a, a knife. Um, but most people out there will buy a weapon when it comes to knives and, or, or that, or in their mind and their mindset, they will always say, this is my weapon Mm -hmm. knife. And this is my tool knife. I will only take this knife out in case I have to fight somebody. You're, you're setting yourself up for failure. If you kind of have that mindset, uh, knives should be utilized as tools and should be you know, extracted and, and, and used discreetly as a tool in urban environments and get the repetition into you every day. Yeah. Because when you need it, you want to have that repetition of being able to access and use. You know, that's another kind of common thing I see that people try and separate a, a knife from a gun as far as the, 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 the both of them are responsibilities. Both of them should be tested and both of them have some sort of software issues that you need to consider before you actually utilize the hardware. Uh, well, I want to talk about that hardware software issue in a second, but you were speaking directly to me, directly to me when you said uh, people who carry around a knife as a tool and then a knife as a weapon, I'll only, carry, I'll only pull this out if it's to play with it and fidget or if I get in a life. So I, I'm, I am... Um, a little embarrassed to say that is my that is because I'm a knife it, lover. I, I just I I, I I I get it. You know, this is a I, I have knives too, and uh, <laughs> people people are always disappointed when I pull out what I carry because it's usually something pretty cheap, right? Yeah. Or it's usually something that I bought at a Walmart or a dollar store knife that I modified at the hotel room by putting some hemp wrap on the handle. And every now and then I get people like, hey, uh, do, are you selling those? And I'm like, I just, I just made this, right? <laughs> I just made it for 40 cents, man. <laughs> uh, I, I, do this, I do this for a lot of reasons. And, and don't get me wrong. I, I, love my, I love my quality knives. You know, I have, a, I have, a, a, I have two, uh, I have, well, I have one maker that I'm just obsessed with, which is uh, Fred Perrin. Oh, God, uh, yeah. I, I, I spend all I, sp- I always spend all my money on his table, um, <laughs> and uh, and I have knives from different people that I carry uh, every now and then. But mostly, I always make it. I, I travel every weekend, so I was just in Cleveland. And before that, I was in Wisconsin. And before that, I was in Michigan. And before that, I was in Mexico City. And that's usually my week. Every weekend, I'm somewhere different. So me carrying around something. From place to place is probably out of the out of the question, and also just for 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 my own you know uh, guilt, who am I to show some of these things if I don't apply it every day? Mm. Right. With, so, without, without stipulating, this is a collector's piece, but this is my yeah. Yeah, and you know I I, I have my 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 uh, 
I, I don't know if anybody ever remembers that movie Face Off. Oh yeah. I remember watching that movie Face Off and thinking it was so cool when the villain steps off the plane and there's a guy with a box with a wooden box there waiting waiting for him with his gun and his and his and his, and his knives and his drugs and his money. Uh, <laughs> I need I a guy some, like that in every city, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I I have something like that in a few <laughs> cities in, in the country, right? And uh you know, one 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 thing I one thing I always try and and and, and instill in people is you can get if you're not armed you can get armed in this in the in the in the span of a few minutes if you have the right mindset uh if you want to point an object anywhere in the city uh windshield wiper blade and a few minutes on the concrete and you'll have a stabbing implement that is enough to do whatever job you need to to do right um the, the ventilator the, pen the, the the crystal big pen and a carpet um, you can get a crystal big pen and sharpening, sharpen the tip of it into a needle point on a carpet because of the friction it creates when you go back and forth on it. That's um, true. I tested that after I watched your video last week. <laughs> um, there, there's, there's a lot of weird uh, ways you can improvise points. Uh, you know, points are the easiest the easiest uh, improvised weapons out there. That's why that you, that's why you see them in prisons. Because you can make them out of like out of, out of a lot of things out there, uh, which is interesting. You know, some people come to the classes, and I, I, I usually give them a homework assignment that they must make something pointed. And a lot of people grew up on popular culture will make toothbrush shanks <laughs> and you know make a lot of weird things like that. And uh, things don't don't act as you would think when you're actually utilizing them on a medium to test. Um, but uh, you know, it's interesting seeing how most of us already have some of the wiring inside of our heads with that because of things like uh, social media, uh, live leaks, and uh, just popular culture. So do you think there's some um, uh, in inbred uh, aversion or human aversion to the thrust as opposed to the slash? Um, it seems, uh, like, <clears throat> yeah, it seems uh, that, like that might be a harder thing to, to get yourself to. So... Uh, uh, in speaking with because sometimes I do the weaponology classes in in conjunction with a trauma uh, a trauma doc right uh, every now and then I have these uh, we call them hive classes which is basically multiple instructors doing the class and as I'm doing weaponology and I have a uh, he's a cross trained 18 delta flight medic dive medic uh, special forces medic and a current tra board certified trauma surgeon. And he is the guy that's doing the medical part of it. So I'm showing something like uh, how to cause a uh, um, how to cause uh, bleeding in the pleural sac that surrounds the heart, right, with a small stabbing implement, uh, which is a very easy and horrific way that uh, thousands of people die every year when it comes to knife-related violence. And then I have a trauma doctor there next to me, and he goes uh, goes over what I'm showing them and how lethal it is, even if he was standing next to the victim with his uh, full med bag. There's a, there's there, there's not a lot he could do to, with with some of the damage that we can that, I, that I'm showing people how to do. Um, the truth of the matter is, you don't need six years to learn how to be an, uh, how to be proficient with a pointed object. Uh, most of the people that are sitting in jail or prisons uh, that have murdered people with pointed objects, guess what? No training. Just opportunity, intention, and mindset. And a Chris um, Reeve knife or some, some, something very expensive, right? Well, the, the, uh, and I think uh, very few people talk about it, if not anybody. Uh, the AK-47 of the knife world is not an Emerson. It's not a Benchmade. It's not a Chris Reeve. It's... It's it's not a CQC six, uh, sadly. Um, it's a it's a Chinese made kitchen knife with a black um, uh, with a black injection molded handle. Sometimes it comes with a sheath. It all of them are made by the same series of companies in China and sold under different brands uh, all over the all over the uh, world. And if you walk into your local Walmart, just walk to the kitchen aisle, and it's about that big black handle on it and uh pointy and sometimes it comes with a plastic uh sheath on it uh meant to guard the 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 the, the uh 
the razor uh, side of it, uh, the the edge side of it. That's the AK-47 of the knife. Well, that's what kills more people on a global scale when it comes to point and object than anything else out there. And it's pretty interesting. I you know I have a picture of it that I show in some of the presentations, and it's next to an Uber tactical knife that's made out of you know got carbon fiber laminated over ceramic. Uh, special uh, circumstances knife that's made through go, go through metal detectors that sadly actually does set off metal detectors because <laughs> it's made out of car because it's made out of carbon fiber. Um, but then you see on the other side, I show them this cheap ass knife. And um, the interesting thing about the cheap ass knife, uh, that's actually that ni- that specific knife in the picture that I use for that uh, that presentation is was. Uh, shown to me and carry and is carried by a certain clandestine special operations unit out there in the world somewhere uh, that I got to uh, share some notes with with and that's what they carry they don't carry around anything anything unique ninja-ish or special right they carry around something disposable and it makes sense oh man it, that does make sense as, as much as I uh, as much as I hate to admit it I just recently bought a three dollar bait knife from walmart and that thing is awesome it is such a cheap piece of junk and it is awesome <laughs> um i had this uh awkward moment at blade show probably a year ago if not two i don't remember exactly which one of them was it was uh, i have i have a struggle with blade show uh some knife some some makers don't like me and uh oh, they don't like you no no Why? Uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm basically doing a uh, a traveling MythBusters show when it comes to knives, <laughs> and 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 I don't and so just to, just right off the bat I don't do knife reviews unless I'm asked to, mm-hmm. but I get a lot of people bringing in what they carry to these classes and then these things fail, or these things hurt their hands, or whatever, and they go online and talk about it, and for some reason they think it's uh, me trying to you know, uh, create some sort of dissent in there. Uh, most people that know me and most people that have gone to the classes will tell you the first thing, the, the first thing I say is don't buy any of the knives that I designed. You know, <laughs> uh, don't, uh, uh, right, right off the bat, I'll tell you that probably somebody in this group is going to pu- uh, pull out a Mora knife and that is going to outperform every single thing here. Oh. That's, uh, that's, uh, and that's going to be the sad truth. Now, there's levels to it, you know. More knife isn't easily hidden, right? So then that uh, that's a, that's a minus. Mm-hmm. But it's ergonomic, it's strong. The edge geometry is perfect. I mean, the Finnish people are some of the most underappreciated stabby people on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> they they are they they are they are somebody to learn from if you if you if you. Uh, well, they're Vikings, right? Well, I mean, the Russians didn't have a too 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 good of a time trying to uh, take them over. That's all I'm going to say. Um, and a lot of the things they did was with their puko knives, their traditional puko knives. Uh, they don't look cool, but they're they're pretty smart if you if you if you go into their use as a tool and a weapon. Um, but it, but again, so people come into this classes and they're kind of like, hey, yeah, so more knives. So I'm standing in front of the more knife table at Blade Show. And one of the students uh, rolls up and, hey, Ed, what's going on? I knew you were going to be here at the Mora table. Have you told these guys, or, like, told them what? That that, 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 that their knife is the best uh, stabbing implement on the planet. Uh, uh, it's just like, no, I haven't. And then <laughs> the, the guy at the table, I don't know who he was, but he looked at me and was like, yeah, this, this, that's not what these are for. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not what these are for, you know? And I get it, you know, that's not what they're for. Just like the Victory Knox uh, sales rep uh, that I met once said, uh, that fruit knife is our best-selling knife in North America. <laughs> and I was like, well, uh, you're welcome for my service. And he said, <laughs> I'll tell you why. <laughs> and he says, but no, Ed, just realize we can't have anything to do with you or or, or, or even signal that we agree with the, the oh. uses being put to it. Because uh, apparently uh, OJ's... Uh, murder knife was a victory knots hunting knife or something like that so mm-hmm. they've had they've had some issues with 
with uh, their knives being utilized in a manner that they weren't well, designed for. Well, that's a hell of a conflation, you with uh, O.J. Simpson, but uh, okay. All right, Victoria Knox, you can relax about that. But No, I mean, I, I don't make any money off that, oh, you know? Course. So And people make make them into what they make them, and they got the idea from me, uh, and I, I love it, you know? They kind of burned it, though, so I, I can't carry that anymore. I have to carry something else. Well, so let's uh, let's let's talk about the Copus uh, designs. You've had Rick Lala make your knife. You've had uh, Ernest Emerson most recently. I, I'm trying to get on the second release of that one. Yeah. Um, um, so you've got yeah, these yeah. you've got these amazing knives being produced. Two of them folders. Uh, one of them fixed blade, and I think you have a couple others. I might be missing JB knife. Yeah. Might, uh, yeah, I have a few of them here. Um, so. Um, one of the so one of the things that happens is that uh, I bring something to a class and show it uh, to people and then use it to tear up uh, something on on the animal and everybody's like wow what's that and then they get really disappointed when it's just uh, an old uh, traditional um, you know pruning knife or or a, uh, or a knife that I bought at a goodwill store nearby or you know, it's usually something pretty disappointing. I mean, or like uh, the other day, I was uh, dropping a few jaws on the ground with this guy. <laughs> well, that's your Walmart. Oh, a Hello Kitty Walmart knife. Yeah. Um, that's cute. How could that be cute. harmful? Well, uh, the tang <laughs> goes all the way up to here, and it's pretty substantial. It's a pretty substantial blade. It's Japanese, so those guys know, know a little bit about knife making, and they still have some... Uh, quality standards so it's yeah, actually you, a pretty you've got great cognitive dissonance with that too you pull out a pink hello kitty knife it's gonna throw someone for an instant i would imagine uh you can actually carry it in your hand and nobody will bat an eye about you carrying a knife in your hand because of the way psychology of color works you're focused on the color not the object mm -hmm. so it has a lot a lot of things going for it i'm and not gonna sell see, i'm not gonna sell hello kitty knives though <laughs> Well, you, you might be able to sell a couple to my daughters, uh, but if you if you were just to see the handle, you'd think it was a spatula just walking through. So tell me about the Copus Designs uh, knife. Now, to me, that one uh, is the closest to your Victorinox um, version of, of, of your knife idea in yeah. that it's injection molded. It's, it's simple. It's light. Um, it's got 154 cm, which is a, which is a substantial uh, upgrade uh, to... To whatever the the Victorinox fruit knife is, but uh, tell me about a little bit of that process um, working with John and and how that was. So uh, the, the the whole idea came from um, I had a uh, I had a Victory Knox knife somebody gave me, and I said uh, I wonder if I could modify it into such a way where it's just optimal, right? And uh, actually, you have one of the uh, one prototypes here. Let's see if we can make something that's optimal, made off the based on that uh, concept of the fruit knife thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing I did is I took uh, the straight handle of a Victory Knox, put it inside of a bread oven. If you're a you know if you're a bootleg uh, Kydex guy like I am, you know what that bread oven bread ovens are good for. Um, uh, heated up the handle, extracted it and with a board i slowly bent the handle into a curved shape so it fits your hand a little bit better um not only fits your hand but also that curvature basically makes it easier to retain in your hand not to slip onto the blade and or not to slip out of the out of the handle so it makes a, it makes for a pretty good handle barred kind of design um and i aligned the back of the knife with the point of the knife so when you're using it to draw out and cut downward or draw behind and cut, it doesn't have a drag on it like a like a karambit style hook would have. Uh, so, you know, when cats open up the claws to grab onto something, they have their claws uh, extracted in such a way where they can pierce in. And then when they retract them, they, they hook on. Uh, this basically simulates uh, something going in and, and and your your wrist does the rest as far as uh, dragging it in, right? Yeah. Um, so I had that uh, weird uh, modified knife, and I told, uh, actually shopped it around to a few people. Nobody wanted to nobody wanted to make it. 
uh, just like the uh, that that folder design, I shopped it around to every single major company out there. Nobody wanted it, um, and uh, yeah, came up with a working prototype. Uh, um, Copus uh, Copus uh, kind of helped me make that into a real thing. I wanted to I wanted to keep its fabrication within the United States because I have a I have some issues with uh, things being made in China uh, personally. Um, and, uh, uh, we wanted to have a very bare bones, simple version of the, uh, that, uh, that, uh, fruit knife that I used to carry, uh, with a bit more, bit more of a sturdy handle, a uh, bit more um, intention built into the design and as simple as we can get them and as low cost as we could get them, even if they are made in the U S. Um, so kind of the, one of the things behind the design also is for it to be utilized uh, and modified by the end user. So it's basically a blank slate, you know, people can do whatever they want with them. And already there's a bunch of people out there stippling them, uh, putting cordage on the handle, uh, making their own sheets for it. Uh, basically everybody, they're using it as a, as a base to, to modify and personalize, which is exactly what we wanted. Uh, sent a few of them out to friends of ours that are travelers, uh, some chefs out there, some hunters, uh, uh, a few martial artists as well. But that's not our fo that's not realistically the, the the focus. It's just it's a field knife. It's a small uh, field utility knife that you can carry in urban and suburban settings, and it's just handy to have. That's what it is, you know. I I, I have uh, recently well. I, I really would like to get one at some point. Uh, I've uh, become sort of, I've, I've been watching a lot of your videos this past week, you know, just to get ready to talk to you and and have been very interested to see not your videos only, but also people who have trained with you who talk about some of the basic concepts um, and, and how that inward facing curve, uh, but not so extreme as the karambit uh, can really kind of multiply any effort you make um, tell, tell me a little bit about working with one of my big heroes, Ernest Emerson, um, who, who has uh, his, own, uh, his own style of uh, knife combatives that he's developed over years of training in uh, Kali and that kind of thing, uh, but also makes some knives that I just love. To me, uh, that is, it, you know, if I had to pick a folder that was going to deploy quickly in a bad situation, it would be an Emerson. I just love that wave and, uh, and his construction and all of that. What was it like working with uh, Ernest Emerson, and and what were some of the design considerations that went into that? It being a folder. Uh, yeah. Um, so, a little bit of backstory there. Uh, I've known Mr. Emerson for a long time. Um, first time I met him was uh, at a, a California Custom Knife Show. Um, we had this small. Uh, conversation without a lot of trust in it, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was asking all the wrong questions to the right to, to the right people, and that kind of I, I remember him kind of like being a little bit taken aback by some of the questions I was asking about knife design and and capabilities. You know, um, I wanted something that I could carry and, and, and that was quality, that was a folder that could penetrate body armor. Um, and could also be utilized as a field knife and just cut with it and stuff like that. Um, I've always been a fan of the fillet knife type uh, designs. So I saw the table there and there was an Emerson Persian, a custom mm -hmm. one behind a case. And I saw that and immediately I was like, that is what I want in my life. Uh, but at this point, they weren't available. You had to buy them secondary market or you would have to win the lottery and, and buy it. <laughs> Uh, just you know, get, I, I always mention this, and he, he always gets a kick out of it. Uh, I consider you know Mr. Emerson not only a friend but a mentor. I've known him for a while, and uh, and I've never won a single one of his fucking lotteries. <laughs> so <laughs> it, 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 it means it means that these lotteries are pretty legit, you know. And it's um, a lottery to buy. It's not a lottery it's a lot, to no, win. No. Yeah, and I've I've entered it, all of them. All of the ones that I've been there, I always enter. And at the end, I'm like, I, I think you're just doing this on purpose by now, man. The only way I'm going to be able to get a, a custom Emerson is to have you make a design for me. That's about the only way. And he would laugh at it. And, you know, later on, it actually became true. Uh, I trained with Emerson uh, when I was act well, when I was still active. 
uh, way back in the day. I can't remember exactly what year that was. Uh, but I remember sparring with him, and I remember seeing his capabilities, and I was pretty impressed. Uh, he also, like, uh, on my side, just as an instructor, uh, he was one of my, he was one of the guys that kind of really, he basically was a, he, he kind of sparked that, that, uh, that interest in my head of, uh, as far as turning into an instructor. So I was, uh, I was, I was, uh, I was, uh, you know, refer back to him as a, as a big influence on that. Um, I learned a lot from him, uh, from mindset to, to no excuses, to get your ass up, to look at me. I'm, I'm older than you are and I can hand you your ass in a basket um I, and i that was i was a, it was a pretty mind-changing uh, uh, experience that i that i got when i trained with him um after that i went back down and i carried an emerson persian uh, mostly for well, most of my career down there in my pocket you know it was a pretty good knife <laughs> pretty good choice of knife um later on in, in life i kind of went my direction and start getting gain, gaining a name for myself it was it was uh it was always awesome seeing emerson mr emerson at the at some of these knife shows because he he knew about me before all the people there so he was that he, he he got a pretty good uh view of my ascending popularity and he kind of got a kick out of it you know he would tell me like ah oh, you're you're pretty known now I was like, yeah a little People know me now. Yeah, yeah. Keep at it. Keep at it. Right. Um, he was very supportful. Um, and then um, I had this knife design. I showed it to him probably three years ago in a drawing, and also uh, like I had a function and you know, prototype made out of a G10 that I built. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Hey, Mr. Emerson, would you be interested in making this?" Right. And he's like, that is a pretty interesting design. And say, yeah, yeah, let's talk about it, right? Uh, the thing with Mr. Emerson is that uh, Emerson has about 80 things to do a day, you know? So you have to you have to nail him down to a board or some way to kind of keep him in one place. So you could we so so we could brainstorm some of these ideas. And he was always running around, and I, I you know I I knew he was busy. Um, we, we came up with this idea to do a con uh, combined class, which was like a bucket list item for me. Mm -hmm. uh, we went out there to his uh, uh, training facility that he has next to his shop. And um, he went into how to defend. And I went into how some bad people attack. So we basically spread out the class in, in two days. So uh, we were doing a back and forth kind of live conversation between what you would envision as a defender, uh, a good guy, uh, 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 a man that is there to defend his family. And on my end, I was talking about the predatory nature, about stripping away somebody's life, about how to target somebody because you want something that they have. So it was an interesting conversation. Uh, Royce uh, Royce uh, showed up like nonchalantly Crazy. to the court. Yeah, nonchalantly yeah, nice. just walked in there. Hey, what's like, hey, up? What's up? Hey, what's up? And I'm Jiu -Jitsu like, Jiu-Jitsu legend Hoist Gracie. Hey, everybody. Yeah, it's like, oh, um, um, yeah, hi, <laughs> you know. And well, he said, uh, what are you from? Uh, from Mexico. Oh, that's why you, uh, the facas. He said, yeah, that's why you know all about the facas. Yeah, that's why you know about stabbing people. Yeah, oh, it makes sense because you're from Mexico. <laughs> Well, I mean, that to me, that's a really great concept. I've been to many, many martial arts seminars, but um, never one with a, a dual perspective like that. Never one that teaches from the, you know, you're always learning uh, the defense and, and uh, offense, but you're not learning the cheap and dirty, realistic, often. I mean, I, I shouldn't say that straight across the board. I, there are a lot of people who do start to focus on that a bit. But. I, 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 I personally, I, I have, you know, nothing but respect for, instructors out there that do their their thing you know and uh and that's just not me you know even even with uh i, I think a reason why you don't see it that much is because there's egos egos get mm -hmm. involved Big time. um and uh if you question somebody about something you know egos get involved i remember uh me and mr everson were in that uh in in the gym and he was showing something uh as far as how to disarm somebody that was charging you with a blade 
and I showed how to counter that disarm during that demo. And and then he looked at it and then he said, Well, then I'll then I'll focus on dropping my body weight till you can't get that opportunity, which is something that he'd never thought about and I, and I never thought about it. So people there were like witnessing, you know, people trying to figure things out live, which is I think in the end that's I mean, I I I I I I I would do it for free if I could if it was like there was no other choice. I do that I did I, I would do that type of class with somebody like Emerson for free because I, I, I know what that is. I mean, I told them and I and I always tell other instructors off the bat, I'm gonna steal your material. <laughs> strip away the stuff your, that sucks. I'm gonna strip away the stuff that sucks. If you show something uh, related to uh, disarming somebody with a knife or to contain somebody holding a weapon, I'm going to figure out how to counteract that because that is my part in this conversation. Uh, I don't want to leave well enough alone because I think stagnation leads to uh, uh, a, a, a dis- disingenuous uh, methodology. So right. I, always, I always try and keep that conversation going. It, right. it seems like a, you know, kind of a defensive or disingenuous thing if you're going to not take, you know, you, you present a technique and someone gives you a counter for it. You, you, you know, you have to assimilate that. Otherwise, you're a charlatan, you know, well, well, or, or you're yeah. someone who's worked really hard for a long time and and you're set in your ways and you don't want anyone showing you something that makes you wrong. Uh, yeah. And, and I've, 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 I've uh, so I've uh, done classes with uh, martial artists and. And I've done I've done uh, seminars where there's a bunch of martial artists there. I remember I did this class out in uh, somewhere in Oakland, I think it was, and uh, there was a bunch of martial artists there. There was an Italian uh, knife instructor who was pretty interesting. He he was showing some criminal uh, knife stuff. Uh, there was a guy from the Mora region of the Philippines who was uh, doing impact uh, related uh, weaponry with these long sticks. The guy was a tank. I mean, you you could you, speaking about feeling somebody being dangerous. I mean, this guy exuded danger, right? Um, and then you would see people like uh, Maya Schroederholm that uh, studied with uh, Sony Umpad. Uh, Sony Umpad, uh, personally, I think he's probably one of the most underappreciated martial artists that the U.S. has ever had. Um, and that man was lethal, lethal when it came to his motion and his movement. He was a dancer, um, and not, but he, you could see uh, the way he showed how to use a blade is unlike any other uh, way I've seen anybody show how to use a blade. He was, uh, he was mathematical and surgical in how he would do his thing. So I t- every time I do a class and learn from somebody, I, I always make it a point to go out to somewhere, take a knee, shut up and see and watch and learn and then see if it's cool for me to to reply right because i i I do a do a i did a class in uh chicago at a 10th planet jiu-jitsu gym and and got to roll with a high level grappler who was ahead of the school who was a black belt in uh 10th planet jiu-jitsu right and he almost broke my arm and my leg with his hands handcuffed behind his back oh during God. a demonstration, right? So he's pretty he's pretty functional. And then I put a knife in my hand and we rolled with that knife and I got a few solid stabs into his chest that would have killed him uh, within a span of a few minutes. Uh, but we're training, we're, and he said, well, eventually his reaction to uh, grappling with me with a bladed object was just to roll out and run away. And grab a chair, right? That that was his reaction after he realized that any of those stabs could have killed him if he was going to commit himself to trying to grapple away that night. And it's not because I'm a badass, you know. It's, I'm I'm nobody. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm just somebody that uh, I'm just somebody that I'm just somebody that listens and replicates. If anything, I I emulate. That's that's my whole deal. I try and emulate what I see. Um, and uh, somebody like me can get the best over somebody like him with a pointing object because the pointing object is it's a it's a universal cheat code when it comes to combatives in a lot of ways. Universal uh, cheat code. 
Uh, let me, let me, I just want to back up to the Emerson Elvia real quickly. I noticed it didn't have, oh, it doesn't have a wave on it. And to me, the, the wave is one of those, uh, one of those things about Emerson knives that makes it, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's all up to Mr. Emerson. That's his, uh, oh. he, he asked me about it. He said, yeah, let's do one like this first and then we'll think about some variations. Uh, I'm not saying he is going to to do one, but he's okay. probably gonna do, he's probably gonna do one. All right. And All right. Uh, I I already I already saw uh, somebody out there made a modification to one of them and oh. put a, a wave on it, and it works pretty good. <laughs> works pretty good with a wave on it. Such a great great uh, hap, uh, you know uh, happy accident that wave thing. Uh, Rick Lala, I just want to talk about him real quickly. He's a uh, uh, he's a Mexican custom knife maker, correct? He's from uh, Bra- Brazilian. 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 I, I do apologize, yeah. Rick. Uh, I have seen some of his versions of your knife, uh, custom versions that are yeah. gorgeous. Yeah, uh, he's uh, he makes pocket jewelry. That's yes. what he makes, uh, and it's beautiful. I mean, I I I, uh, I have some some of my genetics. Uh, appreciate the the gold plated AK-47 so they, they also appreciate some of these uh, amazing Damascus uh, uh, and, and wood uh, designs and some of the weird stuff that he comes up with as far as materials I mean the guy's a the guy's a the guy's an artist he's a, he's a true master of his craft he, he makes some of these things really solid solid so uh, what do you what would you tell people you know, people who are listening who don't ordinary, ordinarily think of their knives as weapons, but are definitely knife uh, men and women and carry them around all the time because they're enthusiasts. What, what kind of mindset would you would you try to in, infuse in them? What would you what would you say to them? Uh, use your knives. Number one, knives are meant to be used, so use them. Uh, don't. Uh, I, I get that there's, there's some special knives that we want to keep. I remember. Uh, going to blade show and uh, flipping a twelve thousand dollar ballast on unbeknownst to me that i shouldn't have flipped it you know right and i remember having that awkward moment where i was trying to figure out uh um, how to uh, gently lay it down to the ground right and uh and um having having this moment where i was trying to figure out what what i would do if i, I had broken it yeah uh, Right. But uh, it, the interesting thing about that experience is that I learned that there's a whole culture around knives as collectible items, which is great. You know, I love it. I've I've I've, I've, I've handled some insanely expensive things and some insanely beautiful pieces of art. You know, um, uh, tra- I, like uh, I think probably my favorite thing I've ever held in my in my life was one of Travis Wurtz's uh, mm. Bowie knives. He has. He had this insane Bowie knife at uh, in Vegas one day, it, that was the closest thing to supernatural that I've ever uh, grabbed. You know, you 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 would think that that uh, green, uh, the green uh, that green sword from uh, flying uh, the, uh, that, the uh, that jade mistress or what yeah, it was yeah yeah yeah. That, I think that's probably how 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 it would have felt. You know, yeah. kind of kind of weightless, but also capable of chopping somebody now. And it rings uh, for like a minute when you pull it out of the shoe. Yeah, yeah. Tra- Travis. Travis is some sort of weird alien knife maker person. I think you know he's the Elon Musk of the knife world. Um, but he's he's he, he, uh, getting to handle some of these things. I get why people treasure them and and collect them. But if you're going to carry something in your pocket with the whole mindset of utility and possible weaponology. Uh, I think I think you should you should take the time to actually test some of this type type of stuff for yourself. I mean, there's there's ways of doing it at home. Yeah. What if uh, you can't get a pig? What would you What would you do? What would you tell the average person? Uh, you you can also uh, make a, a dummy torso out of cardboard T-shirts. Um, maybe an old an old plaque jacket actually does simulate some of the uh, some of the uh, some of the resistance that a, a torso will have. Uh, there's a lot of ways to simulate it. Um, main thing I always tell people is, you know, uh, people dry fire practice, right? Uh, people should also flip open practice if they have a folder or extract practice if they have a knife. Um, one thing I always, I, I do myself is I, I, uh, I have a quick, I have a few quick draw methods that I use 
to extract something, flip it open, and poke something in front of me. All right, or extract something, flip it open, and poke something next to me on my right or my left. And it, it, it and when you see it, it seems like I'm doing something gun related, but it's a, it's related to a knife. Um, there's a tendency to try and separate both the, the two. So you'll he you'll see people talk about anatomical cutting with a knife, and doing less lethal knife related methods that uh i personally don't subscribe to but you <laughs> you see you see people saying oh you'll cut the tendon here and he'll he will he will cease to be a threat to you mm-hmm. um if i take you to a gun range and show you how to shoot people's uh, hands only uh you you will tell me that i'm full of shit, right because i'm showing you less lethal mm-hmm. knife craft right you'll tell me that i'm full of you know whatever um it, if it doesn't make sense in a gun range, it shouldn't make sense in a knife range. Um, and people need to figure out exactly what that means, but for themselves, I mean, they need to they need to put to put to, to put some practice in, some practical skills in uh, as far as uh, manipulating a knife and utilizing it as a weapon uh, eventually, and realize that uh, one of the most uh, underrated skills out there mm-hmm. is medical. Right. Medical medical management is one of those. Uh, so every time I say, Ed, what uh, what would you advise me to learn if I want to become proficient in the art of the knife? And first off, I tell him, first off, it's not an art. If anything, it's a trade. It's a trade skill. Oof. It's not an art, right? Um, and second, uh, if you wanna if you if you wanna become proficient with it, become a healer first. The most dangerous people I know are healers first and you want to have that because um you know um all roads lead to rome eventually uh if you carry something pointed if you carry something that shoots the odds are that you will probably get injured at some point with these objects uh so it's a pretty good idea to have the ability to plug seal and tourniquet uh whatever you might uh, have to in an, in, a, in a bad situation well, circling all the way back uh, to the beginning of our conversation, you know, I, I wanted to at some point talk about Ed's Manifesto, but that might have to wait. But on Ed's Manifesto, you get a lot of your knowledge and experience from your time um, in law enforcement distilled into some really great articles. Um, what, from that period of time, that 12-year period of intense, I would imagine, like unbelievably intense uh, career track there, what have you carried on from that into your regular civilian life uh, up here? Uh, I, 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 if, if I carry something, I have to be sure about it. That's probably one of the lessons that I've learned the, the, the most. Um, we weren't a resource-rich country, so we didn't have a lot of things. Um, I have this, uh, I wrote about it recently. Uh, this moment in life where I was uh, with the Mexican Special Forces uh, units, so I was I was a, I was a police officer, so I could have I have a, I had arresting powers. They didn't back then, so they I would ride around with them, and we would do raids and all sorts of insane things out there. Um, and I have this surreal moment where I was doing my job, doing some site exploitation in a house somewhere, uh, looking for laptops and cell phones and stuff like that. Um, and I went downstairs and all the, uh, all these, uh, soldiers were sitting down around a table eating, uh, abalone from the, from a can that they found in the pantry at the house we were at. A can of abalone about that size was worth about 50, it's worth about 40, 45 to 50 bucks. So they found this, uh, this amazing abalone there and they were, they took, I mean, they're hungry. Uh, they didn't have they don't have they don't have MREs down there, so they all t- basically sat down and had an amazing dinner. I was looking at them, kind of uh, you know puzzled and kind of pissed off that they weren't working. And then uh, you know I looked around and they had guys watching the doors and they had some guys on Overwatch outside and they they would rotate in to have a meal and they would go back out. And then I eventually realized that this is the reality here, you know. It's an upside down reality, but normal is a fluid concept. So, uh, you know, so I sat down and 
took out a uh, took out one of my knives to open up a, a can and broke the tip out of the off that uh, knife. <laughs> I tried to open a can, so that was uh, pretty disappointing. Went to the drawer, grabbed the kitchen knife out of the drawer, uh, made a sheath out of duct tape and cardboard, stuffed that down my uh, my my uh, my waistline, and that's what I carried for about a week and a half to two weeks after that. Um, the the mindset of making the things that you carry worth carrying uh, that, that's probably one of the most valuable things it's what i show people to work with the bare minimum um to realize that you're not unarmed even if everything else around you tells you you should be unarmed or you can't be armed um and having the mindset uh, of not being allowed to and not being able to are two completely different things most criminals know this most high-level government operative, operatives know this. Why not me as a civilian? Uh, why, why, why am not I? I'm not aware of this. Is uh, I think I should, that's a software issue like, again. I think uh, people need to think about the, the the switch the way they think about some of these things. So, how can people? get in touch with you, get in touch with your training, figure out, you know, figure out if you're the right uh, fit, where can they go? Um, so first off, off the bat, I don't, I don't sell uh, DVD sets uh, of, of my system. There is no system. <laughs> um, I don't, uh, I don't sell multiple classes. I sell a basic weaponology class, a basic uh, counter custody class, a basic urban uh, exploitation and survival class that deals with uh, social uh, engineering and some weird uh, forms of uh, scamming the urban environment um, <laughs> that are pretty interesting for some people. Uh, I offer I offer these. They're all of them are standalone classes. Um, the 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 and they change, change every time I do one. I, I add new material or I extract old material, so they're always changing. Uh, if anybody is interested in any of these classes, uh, there's always this. Uh, there's always this uh, thinking that they're law enforcement or military exclusive. They are not. Uh, a lot of the classes that I post up publicly are for general public. You know, all I ask is uh, people be truthful with their names. Uh, people be open to having uh, their names checked because of that that happens a lot. And uh, also uh, be uh, 18 years and older uh, to enroll in some of these classes. That's about it. If they want in on any of them, uh, Ed's Manifesto at smanifesto.com and there's a calendar there or it's Manifesto at uh, Instagram. Um, I usually post up my dates every week in a, in a single uh, class post. And if you haven't been to Ed's Manifesto or you haven't checked out uh, Ed's IG feed, you definitely have to. It's so interesting. There are some incredible uh, articles on Ed's Manifesto like how, like five tips to uh, to get out of a kidnapping, these kind of things that you just don't imagine. And one thing I really uh, pulled out of your article is those kidnappers are watching all the same anti-kidnapping YouTube videos you're watching. So they've made adjustments like the uh, like the little uh, wrist slasher on the, on the uh, zip ties and that kind of thing. So, I mean, a wealth of knowledge that if you haven't experienced it, how the hell are you going to know it? Uh, yeah, when it comes to that, uh, I'm, I'm always I always tell people uh, the, the the what I'm what I'm offering is a is a contemporary glimpse at what some of these things could be. Um, a lot of people offering seer level training out there. Uh, first off, I, I, I was I was never part of that program. I've I've com conversed and shared some of the knowledge that I have with people from that uh, program, but I'm not part of that program. And uh, what I show is all criminal gathered methodology of how to escape, how to detect, how to organize, how to plan, and how to survive some of these things. Um, and also I have some practical direct experience with it myself, not only fighting against some of these groups out there, but finding some of the safe houses that they used and sharing a packet of cigarettes with some of the people who are heading up some of these abduction rings and just getting a conversation going seeing some of their browsing history <laughs> seeing what they seeing what they're looking at and how they're adjusting their methodologies uh based on what they're looking at uh, seeing how you know, just now we're discovering these weird underground networks of ch child trafficking and people trafficking across the world uh with uh, the recent uh, cracking of that uh, cell phone service in europe 
and seeing some of those torture chambers found out there that are exactly exactly like the black sites we would find in Mexico used by some of the cartels. Mm. Um, seeing you know seeing these things proliferate you know on a global scale, a lot of the stuff that people show me now because I, I get a lot of information, a lot of pictures, a lot of things that I advise on by government units and uh, from Europe and from the U.S. and from Mexico. A lot of the things that they send me that they look at as new, I saw probably five or six or eight years ago down south. So the, it's catching, it's catching, people are catching up to it now. So I think it's a pretty important thing to kind of be aware of. So they're innovators. Well, I guess that's a positive spin you can put on it. Uh, I guess really what you're saying is that the, that environment is dynamic. The whole uh, uh, combatives is a dynamic environment. The way things uh, change in a, in a close quarters combat situation is dynamic. So you always have to be learning flexible and uh, assimilating not only uh, what you're being taught by the good guys, but what you're being taught by the bad guys. That might even be more important. Uh, if, if you share the same, uh, if you share the same nationality with everybody you've trained with in the past year, you're doing something wrong. Uh, if you get your, if you get all your news sources uh, from, uh, as far as violence from an English speaking only news source, and you're doing something wrong. Um, if you're preparing for an enemy that somebody came up with methodologies to defeat back in the 90s, and you're applying them as canon now, uh, you're doing something wrong. Um, I think uh, I was uh, one of my mantras is uh, stillness is death. Uh, and it's something I learned early on in my life uh, to not remain still when and, and when I don't mean actually literally remaining, you know, people sometimes say, well, what about meditation, Ed? <laughs> even 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 when you're meditating, you're moving around. Things are all moving when you're meditating. Right. Um, but uh, what I mean by that is having the mindset that even if you think, you know, you you probably don't know. If there is any doubt, there is no doubt. And normal is a fluid concept. And it changes depending on where you are, when you are, and who you are. Uh, so once you once you realize some of these things, uh, the, enemies, the enemy will be more known to you. Another thing I tell people is never dehumanize the enemy because that's a good way to get blind to them. Mm. Uh, you know, we have a tendency to dehumanize the enemy from Antifa to some people to the Taliban to others. Yeah. Uh, you can call them whatever you want, all the derogatory terms you want. But if you don't, if you don't take the time to know their motives, to know their methods, uh, to uh, to learn by hearing, you know, you don't have to agree with them, but you're stupid if you don't if you don't listen, right? And, and you're uh, also you're also foolish if you don't think you don't have that same amount of malevolence in you. Yeah. Well, and every, everyone thinks that they're right and everyone thinks that they're righteous. Yeah. Well, uh, we, we are all villains in somebody else's story. All it takes is the right moment and we can become the biggest villain in their lives. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's the history of the world. Um, but we have a tendency specifically here in the U S to, uh, to, uh, think, think of, uh, think of things in terms of good, good guys and bad guys, us versus them. I think there's a there's there's definitely something detrimental to, to that thinking when it comes to preparation, uh, and I think uh, you know depending on depending on the threats that are coming our way in the future, um, as soon as you realize that people aren't really against you, they're for themselves, uh, it becomes a uh, it becomes more of a clear slate when it comes to trying to prepare for some of these threats, um, and. Uh, I think the truest expression of love we can have as human beings is by becoming assets to the people around us and not uh, not liabilities. Um, that's uh, sadly that's 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 what love means in this day and age, and um, most of us uh, most of us uh, still need to get at it, you know, to become more of a more of a, an asset. Uh, and I include that. I include myself in that list of people. I'm I'm, I'm nowhere near ready, you know, but I'm trying. Ed Calderon, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I really appreciate uh, your time, and man, I really love hearing firsthand your knowledge 
about uh, knives and also just your history and, and actual use and, and that kind of thing. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, thank you guys for the invitation. I, I really enjoyed it.